are still standing, just want us to bow our heads. Just want to pray for a set of people that the Lord impressed on my heart. That your heart is heavy, weary, tired, even offended. The Lord asked me to pray for you that you must not let the fire down. And I'm going to pray for you today and by this praise, grace, God will kindle the fire in your heart again. In the name of Jesus. Father, we want to thank you. And thank you for the word of knowledge that have come into our midst. Lord, we pray for your sons and your daughters that you yourself have identified weary at heart, tired at heart, heavy laden, body in their heart. Lord, I commit them into your hand this same hour through the power in the name of Jesus. Bring comfort into their heart. Relieve them of this burden. Relieve them of this weariness. Relieve them of this tiredness. Relieve them of the disappointment. Remove them of the distress in the name of Jesus. Through this corporate prayer, we pray that you will strengthen them again in the name of Jesus. Let their fire come be kindled. Let them burn for you in the name of Jesus. Father, none of them by his grace will lose their salvation. They will not lose their trust in you. You will bolden them as you embolden a lion in the name of Jesus. Thank you, precious Father. We rejoice for that which you have done already. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Can we give a clap up to the mantle for the Lord God Almighty in the name of Jesus. All right, still standing, we're going to read our text for today, the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 3. And we're going to read 2 Corinthians 5, 7 together. And then we will allow the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do. Hebrews 11, chapter 3, let's read together. One to go by faith. We understand that the walls were framed by the word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. 2 Corinthians 5.17 reads, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Father, bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Please, you may have your seat. Let's appreciate those who are fellowship with online. We want to know that we love you. Let's clap for them. God bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. We started a series on pursuit of God. And last Sunday, by the mercies of God, we talked about walking in love. It's very, very key to your Christian life. Now, let me say something to now remind you. Uh, my ministry, essentially and predominantly, it's about how you as a Christian should live. That's because that is key. God intervened in human affairs and sent the Lord Jesus Christ basically to teach us on how to live. And the first thing God needed to do was to remove the barrier of what can make us not to live right, which is the barrier of sin. And that's why Christ died for us and shed this blood. Can somebody say, thank you, Lord Jesus. And then the next thing he did was to live in such a way that we also will live the way he lives. So this is essential for a Christian. If God washes away our sins and saves us, but we begin to live like sinners, then that salvation is not valuable to God. Amen. So that's one of the reasons why we started this series, Pursuit of God. Every Christian, that should be our heart desire. Every Christian, you must be born in to pursue God. What do you mean by pursue God? To know more of God. The more you know somebody, the more you, in, you are into that person. The more you know somebody, the more that person is into you. So we are pursuing God actively. And one way we can pursue God is to walk in love. Because if you don't walk in love, the Bible tells us clearly, loud and clear, it said, you are not of God. You are tongue speaking, but if you don't love, you are not of God. You are demon chasing. You are dripping with anointing. If you don't love, the Bible says all of those things, they are in vain. As a matter of fact, scripture says they are like empty barrel making much noise. Praise the Lord. But I know there's no empty barrel among us here. 
Amen. Praise the Lord. So today we want to take a step further. How do we pursue God actively so that we can live an effective Christian life? You know, my, 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 my prayer is here, Christ chapel. Amen. My prayer, and it's from the depth of my heart, that God will do things for you that you have less to ask of him. Say amen to that. God will begin to do things for you. You have no reason. For example, God will protect you. You don't need to ask him for protection. God will provide for you. You don't need to have to provide. Praise the Lord. God will take you to that level in Jesus' name. And we cannot provoke that except we pursue him. Amen. So one other way to pursue him is to walk in faith. Can you help me tell your neighbor, say, walk in faith. Say, neighbor, I'm purposed to walk in faith. And then you must also walk in faith. Now, if it is your honey that is beside you, say, sweetheart, I'm going to walk in faith. And then you also must walk in faith. Praise the Lord. Faith is one of the chiefest attributes or a chiefest virtue a Christian cannot do without. You cannot do without faith as a Christian. You cannot do without walking in faith as a Christian. Because without faith, you cannot be a Christian, a genuine, true Christian. Why? Because you are saved by faith. Am I right about it? So if you are saved by faith, that means you cannot do without it as a Christian. Not only that, you cannot continue to live as a Christian without faith. You cannot. In those days, we used to have two major soccer teams in Nigeria. I, uh, is it the ICC? Is it they call them? ICC and IRCC. And Rangers Football Club. And the Rangers always win. And I said, the reason why Rangers always win is because they have a system they follow. It's not broken. You don't change it. And they always win. And the system by which we as Christians live is by faith. When we change it, then we will lose. If we don't change it, we will win. Praise the Lord. Who is the winner here? Shout a big hallelujah. Then you must walk in faith. So you cannot live as a Christian without faith. Because the more you live by faith, the better it is for you as a Christian. The less you live by faith, you know the answer. And that's why scripture says, Romans chapter 1 verse 17. He said, the just shall do what? Live by faith. And as a matter of fact, you cannot live a meaningful or have a removal relationship with Jesus and with God without faith. God himself told us, Hebrews eleven six. he said it is impossible to do what? To please God without faith. It's impossible. There's nothing you can do. You can fast, you can roll on the floor, you can give, you can do evangelism, but without faith, so God says it's all in vain. Hear me again, you cannot handle the devil without faith. Praise the Lord. I said you cannot handle the devil without faith. If you have faith and you don't say anything, the devil will be defeated in your life. But if you have faith and you say so in faith, then the devil will be crushed in your life. First Peter chapter 5, 8 and 9, he tells us, he says that the, your adversary, what does he do? He goes about seeking whom they can divorce. So he said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like roaring lions, seeking whom he may devour. Verse 9, please. He said, resist him where? With steadfast. In what? In the faith. In the faith. You have to resist him in the faith. So let this be clear to us. Again, you cannot key into God's promises. You cannot key into God's eternal plan without faith. Luke chapter 18 verse 8. Jesus said, I'm coming again. And that's a fact. He said, but when I come, will I find people who are key into the plan? Will I find faith on earth? So folks, faith is so important. And faith is to believe the truth about God. Our maker and our creator. And faith is also to believe the truth about Jesus, our master and our savior. If you can't believe God, that is your maker and your creator, then you have no faith. Hebrews 11 3 says, says, by faith, it's by faith we got to know that God formed this world. 
with his own hands. So without faith, there's no Christian life. Without faith, there's no Christian life. Faith is the power. I mean, it's what powers the love of the Christian. And faith, we said, is the belief, the truth about God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So our God and our maker and our creator, he did all he could do so that we can have faith. Think about it. All God did was to make sure that you and I have faith, which is the only thing or among other things that can defeat the devil. And so, God did something. He justified us by faith. The reason why he justified us by faith is so that he himself can be justified to do what he proposed to do in our lives. God gave us faith so that he would be justified to do what he plans for you. And somebody say, thank you, the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, come on, be appreciative and I say, thank you, Lord Jesus. So every Christian needs this godly virtue that we call faith because it's required by God to be in the life of a Christian. I repeat, if there's no faith in your life that is believing the truth about God as your maker and as, as your creator and the truth about Lord Jesus Christ as your redeemer, as your savior, as your master, then you can't have the life of a Christian. What I mean is that God wouldn't do much. God wouldn't be able to do much in the life of a Christian, when the issue of faith is in question, God can't do much in your life. God can't do much in our church. God can't do much in my life if the issue of faith is in question. Matthew chapter 13 verse 58, very, very, very powerful word. Matthew chapter 58 says, Now he did not do many mighty works there because of what? Of the unbelief. Praise the Lord. He wanted to do more, but he couldn't because what is needed for him to do more in their midst was not found there. And what was that church? Faith. He couldn't do much. So, my brothers and sisters, it will be very unfortunate if a believer lives his Christian life without faith. If the faith, the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ and about God is in question in your life, then your Christian life will be unfortunate. I stand as your pastor that your Christian life, by the grace of God, will be glorious in the name of Jesus. Will be honorable in the name of our Lord Jesus. Always keep that scripture in mind. Hebrews 11, 6 is an extraordinarily strong scriptural text that we must know. You cannot please God without faith. Allow me to just make a few arguments about this statement that Paul made and then we'll proceed real fast. Let me ask the question. Does God Almighty that we know have anything against anybody walking by sight? The answer is no. He doesn't have any problem with that person. If you walk by sight, good for you. You get what it gives you. Does God have any problem with anybody who walks by emotions, by feelings, by the situation that happened around that person. Not quite. Because you get what you live for. But the question is this. Does God really favor anyone who walks in faith? Absolutely. Praise the Lord. So it's up to choose. And that's what God has given unto us. The ability to choose. But I'm telling you today, you better choose what God will favor. And it's walking by faith. See, let us understand this principle so that it can profit us, so that it can benefit for. If God says something specific or even something general, it's always because God has the best as the purpose. He has the best as his intention. It's always with the best purpose. It's always with the best interest in mind. If God gives a specific thing, if God gives a general thing. So if God gives a command, it's because best will always come out of it. If God gives us an instruction, if God gives us even a suggestion, it is because he has the best in mind. And watch this. Even in God's anger, if God allows anger towards that person, eventually it will lead to the best. Because the Bible says his anger does not proceed for long. Eventually it will turn around. 
and embrace us back. There's a man who understood this principle very well. And it's the man David. I may be digress a little bit. 2 Samuel 24 verse 14. David said, I'm in a desperate situation. David replied to God, the prophet. But let us fall into the hands of the Lord. For his mercy is what? Is great. Do not let me fall into the hands of human beings. God said, David, choose right now. Fall into my hand. Fall into the hand of your enemies. Fall into the hand of every man. David said, I understand this principle very well. Whatever God does, it has the best in mind. Praise the Lord. So explanation is, David said, <laughs> David said, nothing good comes from the hands of human beings. Whether that human being is a friend or whether he's a foe, nothing good comes from the hand of a human being. But I know this. Even God is a consuming fire. At the end of the day, the best will still come from him. And somebody say amen to this. Nothing good comes from a human beings. So the best comes from God in the sense that God can be trusted to show mercy. But God have mercy on you to trust a human being to show you mercy. Praise the Lord. David said, I mean, if somebody tells us, you know, the way we understand God, let the hand of God follow me. We say, no, no, no. I don't want the hand of God to follow me. But David said, I understand this. Even if the hand of God falls upon me, the best will still come out of it. He said, but in the hand of the human beings, he will not only punish you, he will extend you to your generations to come. Praise the Lord. So, folks, this principle is a, or attitude rather, is a genuine, it's a terrific way to pursue God and to live for God and to operate in faith in God. So, when Paul echoed God that the just, that is talking about you and I, shall live by faith, it's a path that God has recommended for us for living a successful Christian life, for living a meaningful Christian life. When I became born again, I said, well, if I'm going to live this life, I got to be successful. Amen. So you must live a successful Christian life. You see, when you live a successful life, it's not for your own sake. It's for the sake of the Almighty God. He gets glorified because he sees that the work that he has done in your life is coming to fruition. Amen. May I pray for you that your life will never be in vain in the precious name of our Lord Jesus. So it is the exact will of God for you and for me. That you live a successful Christian life. The way God has instructed you. The way God has prescribed for you. The way God has commanded you. Is the way to live a happy life. And it is the just shall live by faith. Amen. Hear this profound word. Anyone who walks in faith. Has God as his or her companion. If you walk in faith. He will be your companion. Even though you walk in the valley of the shadow of death, he will still be there with you if you walk in faith. So in plainer words, brothers and sisters, to walk in faith is one of the shortest way, if not the shortest way in my own opinion, for a Christian to pursue God profitably. And that's what I want us to do in Christ. Chapter. Pursue God profitably. And we said it is to live for God. Praise the Lord God Almighty. Let me say this, because 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. The translation is this, it is better to walk by faith than to walk by sight. It's more profitable to walk by faith than to walk by sight. And let me explain to you, you see, when you live by sight, you will see less in reality. Less and less and less. But when you live by faith, you will see much more of reality. That's it. When you live by, let me just use a common thing. If you live by sight, let's say it's by sight is being paid, you will earn one million. But if you live by faith, you will earn one billion. Praise the Lord. The thing is, is the one million and one billion, both of them is satisfying. Am I right about that? But one is profitable. And that's the living by faith. If you understand what I'm saying, say, go on, Pastor. Glory be to God. For example, if you suddenly leave church today, after this beautiful service, and you get to your place of work, and they give you the pink, 
think uh, sleep. That is the fire you. Are you as a person? First thing that comes to your mind is, wow, this is a challenge if you handle it by sight. In fact, some people will say this is the work of the enemy. If you handle it by sight. But because you start thinking, how will I live now? How will I pay my mortgage? How will I feed my family? But if you haven't that situation by faith, you will know that, oh, okay, all right. I know that better things are coming after this. I know that it's now my time to be an employer and no longer an employee. Praise the Lord. That is the difference between faith and sight. One is better. Much more profitable. Praise the Lord. Don't let me do too much in that. But let us see what are the simple steps. Can somebody say simple steps? Simple steps that we can train ourselves to adopt in our Christian work so that we can always walk in faith and then to keep on walking in faith. Always walk in faith and to keep on walking in faith. The first thing I'm going to share with you today, a simple step that you need to train yourself is to always train yourself to trust God. Always train yourself to do what? Trust God. I'm going to repeat one more time. Always train yourself to trust God. The moment you open your eyes, train yourself to trust God. Not everyone who knows God trusts God. Not everyone who knows God trusts in God. And those who trust in God genuinely are those who really know God. So it's not everybody that calls God. I didn't say that in the scriptures. Somebody said, but master, Matthew chapter 25, don't you know us again? We, we started a church. The church grew. Many came to the Lord. If as a matter of fact, I raised um, 15 dead, it could have been 16. Amen. I have many branches all over the world. I pray in tongue. I do this. God said, I'm sorry. I don't know you. Praise the Lord. It's not everybody who knows God that trusts in God. So if you truly know God, you will trust in him. How many percentage, brothers and sisters? How many percentage? Now I tell you 110%. Not even 100. Trust him 110%. Praise the Lord. So you can see why David concluded and said, listen, it is better that I am attacked by God than be attacked by human beings. Do you know why? He trusts in God, but he can never trust a human being. Praise the Lord. Look at Job as well. Despite the fact that Job did not see God defending him, yet he knew that God will never abandon him to his pain, to his losses. He trusts in God. Amen. I've seen somebody who said, hmm, if I don't get a husband by age 30, so let me give him one more year, by age 31. He said, that's the end of it. Praise the Lord. He said, I'm not going to get married anymore. He said, can't you trust in God? Praise the Lord. Job said, even though he's the one slaying me, I will still trust in him. I mean, look at the Lord Jesus Christ. He heavily trusts in God. When God said, okay, Satan, do whatever you need to do. And Satan said, I will engineer his death. Praise the Lord. And Jesus Christ said, unto your hands. I do what? I commit my spirit. He trusts in God. So the simple step of walking in faith is to have a very strong attitude of trust in God. Very strong attitude of trust in God. I see a man, you know, who was just making money. Making money. Money was just rolling in. So he told me, he said one day, he went to his bank, withdrew all the money in the bank. Brought it to his room, threw, spread it on the floor and began to work on it. I said, why? He said, because I want to show the enemy that my trust is not in this money. But it's the God Almighty. 
So brothers and sisters, if we want to walk in faith and get the best out of Christian life, we must trust in God. 100 and how many? 10%. Praise the Lord. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3. Isaiah chapter 23 verse 6. He says you will keep him. You become God's responsibility. You will keep him in what? In perfect peace. All who trust in you. All whose thoughts are fixed on you. That's what we as Christians we should do. Our trust must be fixed on God. I mean fixed that it cannot be broken. Fixed it cannot be shaken. Fixed that it cannot be cut off. It's an immensely powerful text that you should make sure you familiarize with as a Christian. Hear me? God cannot disappoint anyone who trusts him. He cannot disappoint anyone who trusts him. Another powerful text I want us to look at is Proverbs chapter 3, verses 3 to 5. Let's read an amplified version. Proverbs 3, 3 to 5. It said, trust in and rely how? Confidently on the Lord with all your heart. And do not rely on your own insight. Insight means what you see and what you experience, you join them together. Praise the Lord. All your understanding. Then the conclusion of this. Like we used to say, the is equal to of what you see, what you experience is your understanding. He said, in all your ways. Does it have to do with your finance, your marriage, your health? Your, your, your investment, everything about it in all your ways. What must you do? Know and acknowledge and recognize him. And he will make your path how? Straight. And what? Smooth. What will you do? He will remove obstacles that block your way. Who wouldn't like this? Will you like to have somebody like this as a companion? I said, will you like somebody to have this as a companion? In your business, he will accompany you. In your marriage, he will accompany you. Concerning your health, he will accompany you. Somebody who can remove all the blockage, better let him accompany you and trust in him. Praise the Lord. My trust is in you. Praise the Lord. Always, when you wake up, open your eyes, put your trust in God. It's a great Christian attitude that we must train ourselves. The next simple step I'm going to talk to you about is taking off of that. You must also have an attitude of confidence in God. Confidence in God. Look at this. How many of you know Apostle Peter? Let me see your hands up. Not everybody knows Apostle Peter. Praise the Lord. Apostle Peter, do you know he had trust in Jesus? Serious trust. For somebody to leave his business and follow Jesus Christ was great trust. There's no question about that. But at some few occasions in his life, he lost confidence in Jesus Christ. And he got burnt for that. Job had trust in God on the contrary. But that man simply had confidence in God. And he wouldn't do. He said, he said, he said I'm so confident that God will never do what he says he cannot do. Praise the Lord. Did you hear that? Job said, I, I, I know God. If he says he's not going to do something, I'm confident he will never do it. Praise the Lord. But Peter trusts in God. He loves God with his whole heart. One small boy girl said, I think the way you are talking, you must be a Christian. I said, me, don't say that again. Don't let everybody hear that. And then I said, the way you're dressed, I said, no, 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 no. You see, you, see, you people, that's how you jump to conclusion anyhow. And then I was said, you look like a Galilean. Guy Galilean. He said, look at me. If I come from that place, let thunder fire me. Praise the Lord. He trusts in God. But at that moment, he lost his confidence in the Lord. So as a Christian, you must have the attitude of confidence. I'm talking to somebody here today. You've been waiting on the Lord for so long. You've been believing God for so long. And you're about to give up. God is telling you, be confident. That which you have asked him for, that which you have stand for, that which you believe him for, it will come to you at the appropriate time. It will come to you at the necessary time. It will come to you at the time of the Almighty God. 
you will be blessed. God will be glorified. If you believe that, say, be again. Amen. But you must have confidence in God. Confidence that what he says he will do, he cannot fail to do it. And the best way I can explain confidence in God to you is to have this attitude. Amen. We, use, we, use, we sing it in the church. The, you must have the attitude of no other argument. Praise the Lord. That's how to be confident in the Lord. No other argument. Praise the Lord. But I think the challenge most of us have, probably the challenge what Peter has, I don't know. I'm just speculating. But the challenge most of us have is that we have too many arguments to consider and to think about. Too many arguments. Especially arguments that offers us alternatives. That offers us other choices or similar choices to God. And if we told that way, it always turned out to be contrary to God's will in our lives. And that would be very unfortunate. Let me tell you, neighbor, you are not going to live an unfortunate life. Say it with confidence. You are not going to live an unfortunate life. But you will live a glorious, a successful, a prosperous, a rewarding Christian life. I mean, look at Adam and Eve for a second. The original argument they know they had was that don't eat out of this tree. It's a simple attitude that God gave unto them. You see this tree? Don't eat out of it. And they had that attitude. But then, Satan showed up and said, have you considered this other argument? Have you considered that this tree can be great to eat? Then Madam Eve said, eh, really? Really? Okay. Praise the Lord. Then Oga Adam said, hmm. I don't think it's a bad idea. Praise the Lord. How many of us are familiar with that? I don't think it is bad. Praise the Lord. I've always told myself, if I think it is bad, Oladile, it is bad. Praise the Lord. If I said to myself, mm, it doesn't matter, Oladile, it matters. If Adam and Eve, at that particular moment, wrong attitude. Hear me. Wrong attitude will lead to wrong turn in life. Wrong attitude will lead to wrong choices in life. Wrong decision in life. So folks, a confident attitude in God will always place you, will always position you where God can do the best for you. Christianity is not that difficult. It will always place you and position you in the place where God can do the best for you. Praise the Lord. How will you like it? That God has dealt with your enemy before you know that that person is an enemy. Before he strikes, God said that you, if you lift up that hand, you know, like he told uh, the king, he said, if you do anything to that man's wife, just one word, God said, you are a dead man. Praise the Lord. Amen. Abraham didn't know. He didn't know. That's what God said. If you touch him, you have the authority, you have the power. Nobody can question you. But I'm telling you, touch him, you are a dead man. Praise the Lord. Oh, my brothers and sisters, anyone who touches you is trying to touch the apple of God's eyes. But if you have that confidence in God, live a holy life, a life of love, a life God that can please you, a life of faith, God will always do the best for you. It's a wise way to live our Christian life. Personally, one text, come, I mean, settle my confidence in God. John chapter 14, verse 6. When I read that, came to that understanding, it settled. I told myself, no other argument for me. He said, Jesus said to him, I am what? The way, the truth, and the life. He said, no one comes to the Father except through me. That's, to me, no other argument. Amen. I mean, I told myself a reason. He said, if he is the way, then he is the life. And then he is the truth. And nobody questioned him. Nobody can question him. Nobody has questioned him. I told myself, I need to 
I have confidence in this guy. I trust him. Praise the Lord. No evil, there's no religion in this world that refutes this. Some even support it. Amen. So for me, no more argument. Anytime, anyhow, anywhere, and any situation. No other argument. Jesus is my Lord, and that's a fact. Jesus is my defender, and that's a fact. Jesus is my provider. He's my life. He's my master, and that's a fact. Jesus is coming back again. No other argument. Praise the Lord. It's a fact. That's how to be confident in God. No other argument. Praise the Lord. And this is another step. You can teach yourself how to walk in faith. Have no other argument than the one that God has given unto you. Now let me chip the third one and then we will close and pray. This is a simple walk in faith in God. And this, I call it this. The first one, you must have the attitude of trust. The second one, you must have the attitude of what? Confidence in God. The third one I'm going to share with you, you must have the what I call the Hannah attitude. Hannah attitude. Now, most people are always focused on the intensity of Hannah's prayers. Intensity of the words she offered. And that's good. That's great. But I'm most particularly fascinated about her attitude after her prayers. Amen. The prayer he prayed is good, but after the prayers, it's important as well. And have this extraordinarily powerful sense and a very strong feeling that God himself watches out for our attitude after our prayers. Our attitude after our prayers. I'm sharing with you simple steps to walk in faith and pursue your God to know him more. Because I believe if we go in prayers to God, with a hapless mind, with a helpless attitude, with a hopeless attitude, then God will watch. All right, what is his attitude after that prayer? Praise the Lord. By the way, you are not living here the way you come in Jesus' name. You are living better, say better amen to that. Because if you are hopeless when you go into the place of prayer, you seem hapless, helpless. God wants to see. Is he still as hopeless, as hapless after he blasted those tongues in the church? Praise the Lord. Amen. Is he still as hopeless? All right. She came to prayer fearful, full of anxiety and trouble. Is she still fearful? Is she still anxious after quoting powerful scriptures back to me? God wants to know. Amen. God wants to know, can we pray today? And we're still considering another argument, another alternative, other choices after we have wept and cried in his presence. Praise the Lord. Your after prayers is important. Great attitude for God. So, do the best for you. I, I want to tell you the truth. As a pastor, your attitude is as much as what you tell God. Your attitude. We cannot trust God. We cannot have confidence in God and not be expectant from God. Amen. You see what I mean? You can't trust him. And don't expect him to do something. You can't be confident and expect him to do something. I ask myself this question severally. I said, when I go to God in prayer, what gun, 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 do I expect him to do? Praise the Lord. Do I expect him to do something for me? Amen? Praise the Lord. My brother came here this morning. We prayed for him for his birthday. Do I expect him, God, to do what we ask him to do? Oh, yes, sir. Praise the Lord. And expectation, our expectation is what will make God to do as you have asked him. But he will do what? Exceedingly. More than you can think of and more than you can ask of. 
when you are expectant. Always ask yourself before you pray, do I extend, expect him to do what I'm about to ask him to do? If you expect him to do it, I guarantee you, he will do it for you in the name of Jesus. Hannah said, God, this is what I want. I trust in you and I'm so confident that it is done. So she walked away expecting to see that God will do what God says he's doing. She came home crying. I mean, she came to Shiloh weeping and crying full of distress. But she left with her shoulders high and saying, God has done it for me. Praise the Lord. An attitude of expectation will always move the hand of God to do the best in your life. An attitude of expectation. Anytime you pray in church, in your car, when you're cooking cow, cow meat, anytime you pray, expect God to do something. Praise the Lord. As long as your prayer is godly, as long as your prayer is acts out of good heart, out of love, God will do it for you. In the precious name of Jesus. I know somebody might be saying right now, in his or her, but I've trusted in God. I do have confidence in him. And I'm so expectant. But look at it. He's not done something yet. I understand. And I think God understands also. But this is what I'm going to tell you. Does that mean God won't do what you ask him to do? No. He will do what he asked me to do. Why? Because he will always do what he wants to do. In his own time. In his own time. And the, his own time is best for you. He's best for you. It took Abraham many years of trust. Many years of confidence in God. Many years of expectation. Many years of walking in faith. For him to witness what God said he would do in his life. And the God of Abraham is still your own God. He will do it for you in the name of Jesus. I said, God will do what you ask him to do for you in the precious name of Jesus. Let me read Genesis 22 for you to just strengthen that point for you. Genesis chapter 22, let's read, um, it's a long verse, but it is 7 to 14, I will be fast. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he said, hey, am I my son? Then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a bond offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built another there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hands on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. I know that you pursue God. Okay? Since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked. And there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. As it is to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. I'm convinced that Abraham responded to that troubling question from Isaac with an attitude of expectation. He was expecting God's intervention. I'm convinced. The son said, Daddy, this, everything is complete. Where is the ram? He said, don't worry. Don't worry. God will provide. Praise the Lord. Let me buttress my argument. Hebrews 11, 17 to 19. By faith. Can somebody say by faith? Say one more. Can say by faith. Abraham, when he was tested, what did he do? He offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. That powerful word there. He said concluding. Is that what he said there? Concluding. Praise the Lord. He concluded that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Very powerful. Amen. Very powerful. 
I decided to look at people's faces. They say, man, I know if you do that, we'll praise the Lord. Abraham had killed that boy. And the reason why he was so confident and trust in God is what they were expecting that God would raise him up again. So I want you to learn the principle that will help you to bring a great attitude of trusting God, a great attitude of having confidence in God holy, and a great attitude of expecting the best from God. Expect the best from God because God has the best in mind for you. Abraham said, wait a minute. He has the best in mind for me. He said, in your old age, you're going to have a son. Now he's saying, let me kill the son. I know he still has the best in me. Even if I kill him, you will raise him up again. Praise the Lord. And that's what God's going to do for you in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus. I want you to kindly join me in faith this morning and rise up as we pray together to the God of faith. Amen. I want you to rise up right now. But I want you to do a little exercise for me. I want you to pick somebody. And I want you to help me to preach to that person right now. I say, brother, I say, sister, I want to encourage you to walk in faith. In the mind, tell me to say, walk in faith. Say, brother, say, my sister, walk in faith. Trust in God. Preach to him. Say, be confident in God, sister. Say, hey, together, our expectation will soon turn out to become our testimonies. Talk to him, preach to him today. Say, say, brother, my sister, I encourage you today. Walk in faith, God will do the best for you. My sister, be confident in your God. Oh, say together, our expectation of this God we trust that we have confidence in it. Any expectation will turn to testimonies very soon. Before the end of this year, it will turn to testimony very soon. That if God wills, even before the end of this service, our expectation will turn out to be testimonies for us. In the mighty name of Jesus. If Abraham testified, we will testify as well. And so shall it be. In Jesus' wonderful name, we have preached to one another. In Abraham, you can see that trust. It was trust that took him three days journey. I don't know, but I'm sure he didn't tell madam. It was trust and confidence and expectation that made him to sacrifice Isaac. And the beauty of it all, just to, the reason why I asked you to do exercise, so that you can take something home today. The beauty of it is that whilst Abraham was walking that walk of faith, the God of faith was walking with him as well. I want you to understand that when you walk in faith, the God of faith will accompany you. The God of faith will assist you. The God of faith will back you up. We don't know how that ram got to that Mount Moriah. Whether it was there before Abraham got there. And it was following Abraham along, but Abraham did not notice. We don't know. Whether the ram just miraculously appeared there, we just don't know. But I, this small boy, I know this. The God of faith was walking with the man of faith. Praise the Lord. That I know very well. And that I can tell you. My brother, you are a man of faith. As you are walking, the God of faith will walk with you. My sister, you are a woman of faith. As you are walking, the God of faith will walk for you. But you got to walk in faith so that the God of faith will walk for you. In the mighty name of Jesus. And that's what I want us to pray today. We're going to call upon God in trust in him, in covenants in him, with great expectation. Now what you're about to ask him, he will do it in the name of Jesus. So lift up your voice and say, Father, oh, I can't hear you, church. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, come and fulfill all my expectations in the name of Jesus. Go ahead and talk to God. Go ahead and talk to God in the name of Jesus. Say, Father, in the precious name of Jesus, I pray for myself. If you want to pray for other people, go ahead. I say, Father, I pray today. All my expectations, I put my trust in you. I put my confidence in you. All my expectations, oh Lord, fulfill them today. In the name of Jesus, 
as we are praying, I'm calling upon our God, I'm calling upon our Father to break every boundary, every barrier to your expectations. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I'm joining you in prayer today. At every boundary, every barrier to your expectation right now, the Lord is breaking them in the name of Jesus. I call upon our God and our Father today in faith that God will restore your expectations in the name of Jesus. Every expectation you have of God presently in the past, the Lord by his grace will restore them in the name of Jesus. I'm joining you in prayer today and I pray that the Almighty God will surprise you, his children, by granting you miraculous fulfillment of all your expectations so that you will know that the God of faith is walking with you as you walk in faith in the name of Jesus. Lift up your hands and say, Father, all my expectations, I'm asking you today, confidence in you, trust in you, let them come to fulfillment in the name of Jesus and so shall it be. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Can you just hang with somebody and pray for that person and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for your son, I pray for your daughter, all his expectation, all our expectation, I'm walking in faith with him, in agreement, turn it to testimonies, pray for your brother, pray for your sister, in the name of our Lord Jesus, Rosa I call upon God to surprise us, to surprise you with fulfillment of your expectation today. In the name of our Lord Jesus, go ahead and pray for your brother, pray for your sister, all his expectation, all his as he walk in faith, the Lord will do it. Say, Father, expectations for his children, for his business, for our home, for our family, for our health, for our destiny. Father, let them come to fulfillment in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray today. We pray today. You will surprise my your brother. You will surprise my sister in the name of Jesus. If you are online with us, pray the same thing. Your expectation will turn to testimonies in the name of our Lord Jesus. Thank our Lord and our Father. In Jesus' wonderful name, we are praying. I only have one prayer of faith for you. One prayer of faith for you as you have called upon him. May God bless you. I say may God bless you. I repeat one more time, may the Lord bless you. In the name of our Lord Jesus. Let's bow our heads. My chance, you want to know more why Jesus is Lord. Why Jesus is Savior. There's no argument again about that. I'm inviting you today to draw a step closer in faith. And all it takes to know him is a step of faith. You are here in the house. You say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Christ. I want you to step forward. I would like to pray with you today. You want to give your life to Christ. All heads bowed. All eyes closed. You are here in the church house. You don't know him as a Lord and personal Savior. Please take a step forward. Let me pray with you today. Let me pray with you today real quick. And if you are online, you don't know him as a Lord and personal Savior, this is a great time for you to do. This moment is the right moment. Is the right moment. All you need to do is to respond to that prompt that says you want to get saved. I personally will get back to you. If you want to give your life to Christ, just take the Lord, just, just, just take a step of faith. It's that simple step of faith. And all things, all things will become new for you in the precious name of our Lord Jesus.